Okay, guys, good morning then. Looking forward to another week, 18th of September, and another very interesting week ahead of us. We'll have a quick look back at the highlights from last week and then focus in on what's ahead. Um, not a huge week for economic data this coming week, although at least on Friday we, uh, we get some uh, sort of mid-month uh, manufacturing PMI updates, which are always important. But you know, it's definitely a big week uh, for non-economic data uh, reasons. And as um, Jim Reed in his uh, macro email this morning was talking about, you've got the, the three most powerful women in the world, arguably, um, all delivering what could be uh, market-moving uh, events. So we've got Janet Yellen, uh, key event Wednesday evening. The Fed uh, will meet and deliver their current um, outlook for the U.S. economy, both from an inflation point of view and an economic growth point of view. And uh, their look. Well, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail uh, towards the end of the briefing. But we're certainly expecting a tapering of the. Fed reinvestment program and then really more importantly we want to get a handle on whether they're still intending to do one more rate hike in 2017 or not with traders eyeing December's meeting as uh, the time where they'll deliver the third rate hike of, of 2017. So uh, that'll be on Wednesday. We've then got Theresa May on Friday delivering an important speech uh, on Brexit. It's been a bit quiet through the summer as you know politicians or or the houses of commons shut down for the summer break and so on um so key speech from her ahead of the eu summit and then ahead of the uh, conservative party conference start of october so i think brexit is gonna get be put back on the table as a market influencing factor this week and then finally at the end of the week or indeed at the weekend angela merkel is running for a fourth term and is expected to win quite comfortably and we'll have a look it's more about who does uh, she team up with as a coalition that's really the only sort of uncertainty uh, so yeah Yellen, May, Merkel uh, all delivering news flow so this should keep things moving let's just have a quick look at what happened last week first and uh, we can't start anywhere other than this chart cable um, you know, extraordinary punch up through the 133 handle Thursday, extension of that on Friday. This was the big kind of surprise event of the week, I would say. Um, this is, if we go back on a weekly chart, as I'm sure you guys have done already last week, you know, you're looking at levels and actually, let me just see. So after the Brexit collapse, so we voted to leave the EU end of June 2016 and sterling collapsed in value. Um, you know, dumping to a 35-year low. And, and here we are then. This is the highest we've traded since the day we voted to leave the EU. So these levels seen on Friday and again this morning, the highest we've traded since the very day we, we voted to leave. Um, or I should say the day after we voted to, to leave and the results came in and, and um, sterling collapsed as a result. So this is um, obviously quite a landmark sort of price point to reach and, and the 136 handle if we just go back to the daily chart the 136 handle capped roughly obviously we went above it slightly but the 136 handle capped the upside here on Friday and then dipped of course this is all off the Bank of England you know all of a sudden really from nowhere um, swinging to becoming quite dramatically more hawkish than really most if, if really yeah virtually anybody was expecting firstly we had the inflation data on tuesday which kind of got the ball rolling on the upside for cable um, the inflation print coming uh, back in up at 2.9 percent matching the highest points we'd seen earlier in the year um, so that got the ball rolling with rate hike expectations beginning to edge higher again um, but really, it was the Thursday Bank of England meeting. And of course, they didn't do anything. They didn't change interest rates. But it was the comments that came along with the no change. And the, and the comments were notably hawkish. And then we had one of the Bank of England's most dovish members of the MPC um, uh, coming out with comments on Friday. And um, I did have the comment in front of me. And now I've lost it. 
Just one second. I was going to quote um, directly, uh, except I can't find it, so it doesn't matter. Basically, what he said was, um, you know, we're definitely approaching the time where we may well need to raise rates. That's what he said, basically. And from the one of the most dovish members of the MPC, if the if the most dovish members are calling for a hike, well, and obviously a hike is imminent, and so everyone's now expecting the November meeting. And let me just change up my screenshot here and have a look at this chart just to show you how dramatically, you know, things have just swung on a, on a sixpence here. We were assuming, I mean, I, I would say at the start of last week, it was my opinion, and I even was talking to the new guys at, at Lovett Lane about this, it was my opinion that the Bank of England wouldn't actually raise rates until 2019, probably the second half after the kind of March 2019 Brexit line in the sand. That was my opinion. I thought they would not raise rates till 2019. I have to say, you know, one week can change a lot, though, in terms of people's expectations. And, and I would say that now, well, you know, you definitely, uh, a November hike is, is now the most probable situation. Now, I would suggest that if they are going to hike in November, it might be a one-off hike. I don't think this is like the Fed where the Fed are trying to go through a rate hiking cycle. I think for the Bank of England, it might just be a, a, a one hike or maybe two, I don't know. And then then let's just wait and see how Brexit disrupts things economically. And then, right, we can make a decision. You know, do we need, can we continue to raise rates in a cycle like the Fed or do we actually need to start cutting rates again to support um, economic weakness that might come up from a, a Brexit outcome. So this, uh, this chart's looking at the orange bars. That's the uh, expectations um, at the beginning of last week. So before the inflation data, before the Bank of England event. And as you can see, this is looking at, you know, what's the probability of a hike over, you know, the next 18 months or so. And you could see that uh, February 2019 was the bar where you finally got to 100%, which is meant meaning that one hike is fully priced in. One hike fully priced in by February 2019. That was the thinking at the start of last week. Now, or the end of last week, the white line, the 100% gets hit actually in December. So you now got a fully priced in hike by December 2017. Now, this is such a dramatic, that's a 15 month um, change in timing just in the space of a couple of days. That's what leads, and obviously you can see this white line now tracks up well above 200%, meaning that we've got um, more than two rate hikes fully priced in uh, by the time we hit the, the end of, uh, well, by the time we get to September, this time next year, uh, two, two hikes fully priced in. So if you go back to the chart, this is what leads to dramatic price change. It's, it's dramatic change in future expectations. And these changes in expectations are driven by, you know, really important uh, comments from, you know, people of influence. So in this case, it was the Monetary Policy Committee, the very people who are in charge of interest rates. Um, so that was the big event, certainly, of the week. Um, the other big event, I would say, is let's have a look at this screenshot here. You've got the S&P 500 finally reaching, or well not finally, already reaching 2,500. So obviously this is another new all-time high. As you know, we've been tracking new all-time highs all year. And so this chart from Bloomberg here, just talking about how we've taken out three big handles now. So we've broken up through the 2,300 level mid-February. We then found good, strong resistance at 2,400 before breaking above that in March. Now we've hit, and I don't know yet, will we find resistance or not? We'll see at 2,500. So it's been a relentless march to the upside. I guess what you could say is what was ironic in a way was the day that we, you know, we had a big up day on, our, well, I guess it wasn't a big up day. We had, we had a big, big start to last week for US equities, um, which was mainly off the back of the idea that, um, you know, the North Korea situation didn't escalate despite that another rocket sent over Japan. Uh, the hurricane Irma didn't quite do as much damage as, as some had feared. 
And then actually we got a good good inflation print out of the US last week. So maybe that inflation weakness has just turned and, and we'll talk about that in a sec when we talk about the Fed. But yeah, we've got you know the S and P up at twenty five hundred. Um, and I say ironically because on Friday we actually had some pretty bad data from the US when you look at the retail sales figures. However, this was on the headline. These numbers came in in negative territory when we were expecting retail sales growth. But as you can see on this chart, um, it can be quite easily explained away as a hurricane impacted month for retail activity. Um, so here we got hurricane impacting uh, the so the blue line is Texas versus then the the yellow line or the golden line is is the other states. So now on this, um, because believe it or not, this this Irma thing, of course, causing huge devastation, particularly to the kind of low lying Caribbean islands. Okay, in the end, Florida didn't quite get smashed as a lot were worrying. I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of damage there. Uh, but actually, unfortunately for the US, we may well have um, another front coming in. So have a look at this graphic. This is looking at actually two storms uh, currently. Um, so you've got um, you've got Maria. No, sorry, this is Jose, not Maria. So Jose is up here just uh, testing the kind of northeast coast of America. But the bigger concern is um, is Maria, which is this uh, storm that, that's that's heading towards the Caribbean, you know, towards the areas impacted by Irma. Here's a closer look at this Maria one, which people are potentially getting a little bit worried about in that it might build to become a, uh, a hurricane force. So this is where it's going to track over the course of this week. And by the time we get to the end of the week, um, you know, we're going to be you know, hitting some of these Caribbean islands. So we need to keep a, uh, tabs on this, you know, just only a, a, a week or so after Irma, you know, obviously already devastation in this region. And, and we hopefully this will veer off and calm down, but this needs to be um, monitored. Um, so let's talk about uh, the week ahead then in a bit more detail. So I'll go back to the charts here. As I said, we've got, you know, started off the week on the front foot. We have relatively positive sentiment coming out of Asia. It's uh, a nice sort of carry on theme from uh, Friday last week. Uh, you've got the DAX here, for example, uh, trading up at the highest levels that we've seen since July. So uh, a two month high here for the DAX. Obviously, for the DAX, we're not, we're not at all time highs. Those were set back earlier in June. So some room to go here to get back to levels we were trading earlier in the year. But definitely positive sentiment. New two month high for European equities as we start the session. Um, you've got a little bit of pullback on cable. And that's because, well, two things. You know, this is perhaps one of the most interesting markets, of course. Now we're up here. Can it stay up here? Obviously, last week, pretty much entirely driven by uh, interest rate hike expectations in the UK. But this week, attention is going to shift to interest rates in the US. And attention is going to shift back to Brexit when we get to Theresa May's important speech in Florence on Friday. So it might be that you get some potentially dollar strength if the Fed choose to be hawkish on Wednesday. And maybe some sterling weakness, depending on what Theresa May says on Friday. So you know, now we've gone up to 136. There's certainly a lot of room to move back lower if the Fed are hawkish, if Brexit nervousness starts ramping higher again. So um, plenty of interesting volatility to come here. With, with regards to the Fed, um, what are they going to do? Well, on Wednesday, they have their meeting, of course. And this is um, the meeting where they also update their dot plot to guide us as to how quickly they intend to raise interest rates in the future. They also update their inflation and growth forecasts for the next uh, couple of years. And also Janet Yellen has a press conference, uh, a live press conference. So, you know, it's, it's normally every other meeting that the Fed choose to act. And that's because there's a press conference and Yellen can use that to try and uh, get the message across properly as to why they've acted and try and calm markets uh, after a hawkish policy change. So this Wednesday, we're expecting them to taper their reinvestment program, which in simple terms 
means that they're going to start reversing their QE um, program that they began in 2008. So this is a program that led to four, $4 trillion dollars being created by the Fed and pumped into the system. All that money still in in there. I mean, you can have a huge argument as to whether it got in in there properly or not. But the point is, the money supply is still at its peak, and we're expecting the Fed to begin an incredibly slow journey of reducing the amount of money supply. And this is going to start by them tapering. So not reinvesting all of the funds that are coming in when some of their assets they own, these, these fixed income assets, when they reach um, maturity, they're getting redemption payments. And at the moment, they're reinvesting all of those by buying more bonds. Uh, but they've decided that it's time to not reinvest all of it. And so really, we want to see what's their, you know, what's the, what's the proportions here, how much of their um, reinvestment are they going to stop? What percentage of it? This is, so we'll talk more about this ahead of um, Friday's key event. Um, but I'm showing you the chart of inflation here because we had a very timely uh, uptick print in inflation last week. This is August inflation for the US. Very timely because we've had a weak run. If I just very quickly show you a chart um, when you're looking on year on year basis for the US. Um, We've had a very weak run over the last five months or so as inflation sharply um, trended back lower to 1.6. And it's a very timely turn in the trend, just in time for the Fed to go ahead and taper reinvestment. And also, I think, continue to stay the course with regards to guiding us they're going to hike rates in December. I think the, the interesting thing might be how many rate hikes do they tell us they expect to do in 2018 because currently it's three and I would say there's a strong argument to say they might be a bit more cautious and turn that into two rate hikes next year so that might be the dovish element of Wednesday's meeting to offset the hawkishness of tapering reinvestment and guiding us they're going to hike in December okay so we'll see but that was a very timely uptick in inflation that gives the Fed room to, to do what they really want to do, which is continue their hiking cycle. Um, okay, what, are, what else? Other stuff in the mix? Well, I know a lot of you are interested in Bitcoin. We don't talk about this much. Um, I'd say the professional trading industry is still... Uh, very skeptical about this and doesn't really view it or consider it as a, a proper market. Um, obviously, in the retail space, that's very different. It's an incredibly popular uh, product and people are taking it very seriously. But that's mostly because of the the distance it's traveled to the upside in such a short space of time. Um, this is a chart from the FT this morning, just comparing this chart of Bitcoin to bubble, a classic bubble pattern. As I'm sure you all know, Bitcoin just absolutely smashing through the roof this year. We started off at the beginning of the year, Bitcoin trading at $1,000 per coin. And last week, we almost hit $5,000. Now, um, if you're telling me that's not irrational, then I will question your, your sanity. What's, what's interesting about last week is, you know, <laughs> with the good times, unfortunately, with these uh, immature, uh, highly volatile markets, with the good times comes bad times. Um, inevitably, after the spikes comes the crashes, and we dropped from 5,000 to 3,000 last week. Now, this is comparing this to a bubble, you know, greed, delusion, then it sharply corrects, denial, then you get a bounce and it's return to normal in inverted commas before then fear, capitulation, despair and all the rest of the emotions that go along with roller coaster rides. But um, I would say about this chart, in defense of Bitcoin and all of those who trade it, I would say there was a huge portion of the professional industry saying it was a bubble at 3,000. And it corrected back to almost 2,000. This is a month or so ago. Only then for the thing to go from 2,000 to spike and double in value and get to five. So, I mean, 
It is irrational, but it doesn't mean it can't carry on going higher. I guess that's the point to make. The reason for the correction last week, you got to be on your toes here with this Bitcoin stuff, because if you're long, you got to be aware of the type of news flow that has an impact on it. Last week, it was China and indeed back um, the correction before that was China. So China's big three Bitcoin exchanges said they would halt trading. So this is just underscoring concerns about a crackdown by regulators uh, in China. So this is one of the biggest cryptocurrency markets. So China driven. Of course, in the past, we've had the likes of Jamie Dimon, um, CEO of, uh, of JP Morgan, calling Bitcoin a fraud. Uh, better suited for drug dealers and murderers than legitimate businesses. So says the longest serving CEO of a global bank. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's obviously still question marks as to whether this really is a credible currency for the long term. While those questions still get debated, you're getting phenomenal price action. So just be aware we're back to 3000. I mean, if you just want to look at this technically, then a bit of resi a support of 3000 or just below it. That was the top of the spike that we had. Um, earlier on in the year. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens this week with Bitcoin. Is this a sharp pullback before the uptrend gets back on track? Or is this the beginning of the bubble bursting? Um, you know, around 3000 is critical as a price point. Okay, let's look at Merkel. I haven't spoken about Merkel yet, but we'll talk about this more during the week. Um, because the, the elections at the weekend, but we will be he hearing from Merkel quite a bit this week in the run up to election day. And as I said, you know, she's going to win. It's just a question of who does her CDU party team up with to form a coalition? Well, currently, um, this is based on approximate percentage of projected seats in parliament. We're looking at the CDU, CDS, SPD coalition okay so it's almost certainly cdu cs csu sorry so merkel's party's cdu teaming up with csu and then it's like well who will the third party be so spd perhaps at the forefront of that um you can see what we've got on this graphic and we'll talk about it later in the week but it's just the idea you know depending on who that third or even fourth party is in the coalition. What does that mean for things like economic growth projection? What does it mean for job creation? What does it mean for tax? What does it mean for Brexit? Um, you know, maintaining a hard line on Brexit. You know, actually all these coalition makeups are, are fairly similar on that metric. But um, we'll talk about this. But, you know, it's fairly safe. You know, Merkel's going to remain in charge. And so, you know, the longest serving EU um, head of state will continue in in her role and the status quo will be maintained um, let's have a look the other stuff this week I said data wise it's quite it's, it's not particularly that interesting um, and that certainly includes today if I just increase the size of this we've got some inflation numbers from the EU and that's you know that's 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 important obviously so that's at 10 o'clock and that's really it for the day in terms of economic data do bear in mind mark carney talking he's at the imf in washington he's talking at four o'clock uh, london time obviously this is important because of what happened last week at the bank of england and what happened to the value of sterling so be aware of that they're the two big events today inflation at 10 o'clock out of the out of europe and um, carney at four um, in terms of other stuff this week on the data front not much we've got zew out of germany tomorrow which is an important one um, other than that, Fed rate decision, or more importantly, the reinvestment tapering of reinvestment decision on Wednesday. You got Philly Fed on Thursday from the US. On Friday, you got PMI data um, from Europe um, and the US and indeed China. So these are mid month, actually, not China, sorry, just the US and Europe. So mid month updates for September. Um, so it's more about the speakers this week, I would say. So it's more about Yellen. Merkel, May, um, Carney potentially today as well. All right. Um, I will finish actually with oil. So I'm going to switch back to the chart and let's just finish the briefing by talking about oil, which hasn't had much of a look in recently in terms of us talking about it because 
Number one, there's been interesting moves elsewhere, like on cable. But actually, if you check out oil, it's been quite an extraordinary year, really. I've got it on a weekly chart here. Um, you know, as we came into the start of the year on the up and uh, trading up at 52 bucks, and we've had some pretty big swings up and down in recent months. We're trading back on the $50 handle. If I go to a daily chart, just looking at the last few months, you know, huge movement. Go back to May, we had a massive sell off from 50 down to 43 and a half. Then we had a huge rally, 43 and a half up to 52. You know, all these are like 15% moves. Big, the biggest move of all came in June from 52 bucks to 42 bucks. Um, that was more than a 20% sell off. Then go from mid June to mid July and you go 42 back up to above 50. Um, then a reversal back to 45 and a half. Now we're back up at 50. The key question for this week, can we sustain anything above 50 bucks? Because we tried it in at the end of July and again, start of August and we failed um, and, and we corrected back into the mid 40s. Can we punch above 50 and stay there? Can we move and have a little tester of the $52 handle that we tested back in May? Um, I think what happened, certainly what helped last week, and we need to keep tabs on it. Um, we had a lot of the, well, some of the uh, shale industry beginning to guide the um, output for 2018 is going to be slightly lower than what they thought. Um, the rig count uptrend beginning to calm down. Uh, maybe the idea that there's uh, pressure in terms of carrying on um, ramping production higher in the US, maybe this price point months and months down below 50 bucks is just beginning to take its toll. And we might see uh, that kind of production increase trend flatten off um, as we go into year end. So that's kind of what's led to this. And we've obviously had a lot of dollar weakness, of course, as well, which helps to support oil prices. But look, $50 is very important. I think technically uh, we hit it last week on on Thursday and we're still up here. So there's no immediate reversal. Look at what happened last time in August when we hit 50 bucks. We had a very large reversal off it straight away the following day. That hasn't happened here. So no immediate rejection. Um, well, what we want to see, can we break above Thursday's high, which will really take out what's more important, the August high and the July double top. Um, so keep an eye there and that might well release a move up to $52 as we go through the week. Um, okay, that's it from me for now, guys. Uh, have a good week. Uh, key data at 10 a.m. where we get an update on uh, August inflation from the EU. Okay, thanks very much.